Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Bob Cimino. I'm the Director of Business Development for Building Security Services and Systems. Uh, we're here to present on this topic of building video surveillance system and management basics. Uh, we're gonna try to describe to you uh, what an overall system looks like, the capabilities of the system, and things you could do to keep that system running properly. Uh, as we go through, we, we'd like to answer questions that you may have, and we're gonna do that through the Q&A section of the, uh, the Zoom webinar. So if you do have a question, we'd also appreciate if you could add in your contact information. And as we go through, if we need to get any more information uh, beyond the, the answer that we can provide you now, we'll be able to get back to you for that. We'll also have our contact information available at the end of the presentation. So with that, we're gonna start the program. A little bit about building security systems. Uh, it started out with uh, Building Security Services founded by Joe Ferdinando in 1982 as a security guard and concierge service. In 2010, Building Security Systems was launched as a complement to that guard service uh, to provide clients with high quality video surveillance, access control, and other electronic security systems. A little bit about me. I had 37 years in law enforcement, training at the FBI National Academy, did school threat assessment training, I worked in retail security for a time and also received uh, manufacturer training on many of the products that we provide. And Chris DeMeo, my co-presenter, is going to tell you a little bit about his background. Hi, my name is Chris DeMeo. I'm the Director of Installations for Building Security Systems. Um, so I'm a veteran of uh, nine years in the United States Army. Um, I've been working the last 15 years in electronic security systems. I hold my... Uh, electronic uh, security installer's license in New Jersey and in New York. And I hold a fire alarm installer's license in New York City. Um, I also have manufacturer certifications for almost all of the, um, the uh, products that we use here at Building Security Systems. So that allows us to be able to maintain and service them to uh, the highest level that we can possibly do. So first thing we'd like to do is to show you a little fun video to start with. Um, the idea behind this video is to show you the value of cameras. So what we have here is a door broken down. If we didn't have the camera, all we know is that we have a broken door in this building. So we don't have a lot of evidence to go on. The camera helps us to fill in that story. As you can see, this is not probably what anyone would have guessed happened had they come back to the house and saw a broken door. But thanks to the cameras, we can fill in the holes in that evidence and we can get the entire story that happened. Now, I'm guessing that most of you aren't going to have a bear break into your office building, but you may have an issue where you only know a little bit of the evidence and we don't have the whole picture. So basically, that, basically. that evidence, that, that camera video can fill in that gap for you. And that's really what we're talking about here. So what is video surveillance? Video surveillance is the use of video cameras to transmit a video signal to monitors and or recorders for the purpose of deterrence, observation, and documentation. Now, within those overall schemes, we can talk about the effect as deterrence with crime prevention, or in certain cases, displacement. So moving that crime away from your particular area or property. Observation in the sense that it gives you situational awareness. It lets you know what's happening in and around your facility. The implications there are certainly that of potential liability issues that you may be able to find through the use of that. Or if there is a claim made against your property, uh, you would have the ability to go back and review that video to determine what may really have happened. Uh, that video then becomes documentation. It's evidence that can be used in some type of a court proceeding. And it could also be used just for you to determine accountability for people that are responsible to work in the property. It could be contractors or other people that are coming through. You need to be holding those people accountable for some particular service or duty that, that they're required to do at the property. Okay. As far as the effectiveness of video, we could point to a 2017 study of the British Transport Police statistics that were done in the UK. 
that determined that video was available in 111,000 offenses, and it proved useful in 65% of those offenses. Cameras were also deemed useful in 62% of the robbery investigations there. And for serious assault cases, they were useful in 61% of the cases. When investigating a theft from a business, cameras are useful 53% of those cases. Of course, the implication here is that this data is, is gathered from the UK, which has one of the highest amounts of video cameras of any country in the world. They frequently do studies about the use of their video equipment. Thanks. Okay, so what, what are your goals for a video system? If you have one currently and need to upgrade it, or if you're gonna purchase and install a new video system. Well, a lot of times when we get to a property and we're asking what the, what the expectations are, what the needs are, the things, the, the capabilities that come to mind are referenced in terms of the ability for detection, the ability for observation, recognition, and finally, individual identification. And what you can see in these slides is those various levels of viewing that the camera system can provide. So you see in the furthest distance, you're seeing detection. It's basically seeing, it's the scene can detect something going on. Next, at a closer uh, distance, you're seeing observation. You're making out, you can, uh, you can identify that as a person rather than just an object. Coming closer, now we're at a point of recognition. And then even closer still, that camera view is giving a level of view that amounts to identification. That person can be identified individually from another person. And on the right-hand side of the screen, you're seeing another level of that identification. Those three individuals, by virtue of the tight shot that that camera can provide, they can each be identified individually. This is important when you construct a system so that we can put the proper types of cameras and combinations of cameras in so that you can achieve each of these levels of video viewing for your facility. Another point to consider, are you going to have passive or active monitoring? Will you be viewing live regularly or continually, or will it just be a periodic review uh, historically? So certain places will operate with uh, security operations centers that are staffed 24 seven that could look and, and change the uh, camera views or equipment and other people will just need a historical reference and recording of what's happened at the property. So those are considerations. All right, so we're, we've talked about the needs and some of the things you may need the camera system to do and some of the things that the special circumstances that you may need it to, to think about when you're installing a camera system. Um, now we'd like to go over a few of the components that go into the camera system and kind of a theory of operation so, so we can understand what we're all talking about and we can see how everything kind of works together towards the end goal. Um, this slide right here, I just like to touch on this briefly. This talks about the difference between analog CCTV and IPC uh, surveillance systems. So analog systems are your classic uh, CCTV systems. Everything works on cable TV wires. This is the original technology that moves back to the uh, 1980s. Um, really what's happening is these are sending an analog signal. If you think uh, an old uh, TV signal over the air, that's an analog signal. Um, you can, uh, each camera is connected to the DVR or the recording device with its own separate uh, wire. It goes directly from the camera to the recording device. So every camera is its own piece. Uh, and if we want to run a new camera in an analog system, we have to run that wire directly from the recording device all the way to the camera. So if that camera is on the 22nd floor and your recording device is in the lobby, that's a long wire run. Um, the other thing that the analog system uh, needs to do is power those cameras. And the way that this technology works, it's an older technology, that power goes over a separate wire to each one of the cameras. So each camera will have two wires attached to it. Um, and the other key thing that we need to remember on an analog system is that the resolution on the analog system is very limited based on the technology of the wiring. 
So we're not going to see analog systems where we have anything really more than 1080p, two megapixels is about the maximum we're going to get on an analog system with very few exceptions and, and tweaking and doing some crazy stuff. Uh, but mostly you can expect to see no more than 1080p on an analog system, and that's using really good cameras and a really good NVR, uh, a DVR. The IP-based system now, on the other hand, this is the basis for almost all modern camera systems. The big difference is this is a network system. So that means that every camera has a specific IP address. It, there are not, each one doesn't come back to the recording device on its own wire. What happens is there's one wire that returns back to the recording device and the data all flows from all the cameras over that one wire. And what happens is it's separated out using camera IP addresses. So the system is smart enough to know this information came from this address, so therefore we know it came from this camera. So there it puts the information back together and you get a beautiful picture of, down, of what you're looking at through that camera. The big advantage to this, one of the big advantages is wiring the system. We can wire in a, in a network system, we can add what's called network switches in and they act as branch points for our wiring. So we can have a network switch anywhere in the building on the 20th floor in an IT closet. If we wanna add a camera to this 22nd floor, we only have to go a small distance to add that camera in. Um, the other main advantage to an IP-based system is the resolution that's possible with it. We can get exponentially greater resolution and view and picture quality out of an IP-based system than we ever could out of an analog based on just the limitations of the analog technology. Okay, so real quick, we're gonna go over the seven main components of any video system so we can understand how everything kind of plays together into the big picture. One is the cameras. This is where all the information that we're gonna to get to use enters into the system. So everything that all the data that we have at, from our camera system came from the cameras themselves. So those are a real important part of the system and they kind of gauge what you have to work with past that. Two is the wiring or transmission method. Um, they can be either standard wires, be they network cables, CAT5 or CAT6, the same as that uh, connects to your computer to the internet. Or we can use uh, a CAT, um, sorry, a cable TV cable or RG, RG, RG59, which is uh, a coaxial cable, it's called. Those are for the older analog type systems and they're limited to their resolution and they're limited to one camera each. Uh, the other transmission methods we can use are wireless, be it Bluetooth or uh, Wi-Fi, or we can use a point-to-point -point system, which is a, a set of transmitters that can go from one building to the next. Say if you had a main building and an outbuilding, uh, we don't have to run a wire across the parking lot. We can use these point-to-point -point transmitters in order to send that camera data. The third component is a monitor. And when we say monitor, we mean either the traditional camera style monitor that's sitting on top of the recording device, showing you a live picture of the cameras, or the monitor could be your smartphone uh, operating an app, showing you your cameras offsite or onsite. It could also be a computer sitting on your desk. You can log directly into the recording device and manipulate the data right from there. The fourth piece we're gonna think about is the recording device itself. This is an NVR or a DVR. An NVR is a network video recorder used for IP systems. And a DVR is a digital video recorder, mostly used for analog systems. Both of these do the same thing, but in different ways. Basically, the recording device is the brains of the unit. It takes all the data that comes in and it analyzes it and it does what it needs to do to get all your analytics in there and it also sends it off to be saved. So this is where all that data is manipulated and used in a way that we can best understand it and, and best put it to our uses. Five is the power. All the cameras need power. Um, so that power is, to, is to, uh, transmitted one of two ways. In a IP-based system, that power is most likely transmitted using a PoE switch or power over ethernet. What that means is the power for the cameras is shared on the same wire as the data for the cameras on that same uh, network cable that carries both the power and the data. So the advantages of that are obviously one wire, less to install, less to maintain, less to go wrong. An analog system uses power traditionally from a power supply, which is a separate unit, a separate box that supplies power to the cameras. 
and they travel up on their own set of wires, not shared with the data wire. So each camera has two wires, adds an extra step into there, and one more thing to go wrong. Uh, number six is the video software. For all intents and purposes, this is the part of the system that most people actually care about because this is the part that you interact with the most. So this could make or break your system for you. We've seen, I've seen some wonderful software out there that does amazing things, but no one can understand how to use it. So no one ever uses those amazing things that are built into that software. It ends up being very frustrating to use. It's, people end up just using the simple features and you don't get what you need to get out of the system. On the other hand, there are some wonderful systems out there. They're very intuitive. They're very easy to use. They're very powerful. And if you can use Windows, you can use these systems. And it makes it very easy to take all of the abilities that your camera system has and to use those to, you, to your best advantage. Um, here at Building Security Systems, we, we really kind of focus on picking the software that we feel is the easiest and works the best for our customers. Because if you're, if you're getting a system that has all these options, you want to be able to use those options. And sec seventh is the storage. The storage is where that recorded footage goes and lives until you need it again or until it's time for it to be overwritten by new information. So the storage can either be local, which is a hard drive or uh, stored locally on your server, or you can cloud-based your storage. And that means it's sent off to a third party where it lives on a data farm and it, it stays there until you need it and you can pull it back over the internet. The main thing that's gonna decide whether you need local or cloud storage is usually the cost. Local storage is obviously less expensive, but you are responsible for backing up the data and making sure it stays safe and making sure that it's there when you need it. Whereas a cloud-based storage, they take care of all that, but for a price. And now we're gonna go over some of the terms that you may see when people describe cameras or a camera system to you, whether it be on a quote or whether it be on a walkthrough, or whether it be on a sales call, you may hear some of these terms being used. And we're just gonna go over a few of them so that you can have a better understanding of what somebody's talking about when they say these things, when they rattle off these terms. So you may hear people describe cameras as having XYZ megapixels. And what that means is that's the resolution of the camera. In other words, how much, how clear the image is, how sharp and, and good the resolution is, and how much information is pulled in but with every image. So real quick, uh, a guideline for you. Two megapixel camera is approximately 1080p or high definition standard, high definition TV. A six megapixel camera is about the 4K level. So if you have a 4K high, high def TV, that's about the picture you can expect from a six megapixel camera. Now, as you can see, we go up to eight, even 10 megapixels now. So sky's the limit on, on IP cameras, all right? The only thing you have to think about is the higher resolution that you have, the more storage it takes. So. It's wonderful to have all your cameras at eight megapixels, but you really have to think that that is gonna take up a ton of storage space. So you have to ask yourself, do I really need this? How much does storage cost? Is it worth it? You have to find that happy medium beside, between functionality and cost. So the second thing we'll talk about is motion detection. This is a way we can kind of mitigate using a lot of storage. We can set the cameras to motion detection, which means if we have a camera looking down in down a hallway, if that hallway is empty with nothing going on in it, we can tell the cameras, don't record this part. I don't need this. We can wait until the camera sees some sort of motion in that hallway, then it snaps to recording. So that way we're not wasting valuable space on our hard drives to, to look at empty hallways. And it also makes it easier to see when there is an incident because you don't have to run through hours of dead footage to get that 30 seconds of excitement. So the next thing we'll talk about is uh, true uh, WDR, which is wide dynamic range, the infrared night vision, and the analytics. We're gonna discuss those in the following slides. So I'm gonna hold those off for now. We've got some demonstrations to show you on those items to make it easier to follow. We'll talk about next the video integration certification or the watermark. This is a feature that allows you to verify that this, the footage that you're giving to a third party hasn't been uh, tampered with at all. So if you need to supply footage as evidence to the police, to your insurance company or a third party, this watermark is something that the, that the recording device puts on, it's a digital signature onto the file. If that file is manipulated in any way, that watermark will disappear. 
and we'll be able to tell that this is not the original footage. It's very valuable, valuable to have if you need to supply evidence using your camera system. Programmable privacy zones are basically just what they sound like. They're zones of the camera which will not be recorded. So if there's uh, an entrance to a locker room or a, a desk that has uh, paperwork on it that has sensitive information or private information, we can, we can denote a zone that will show up as black on the recording, will not record. So that's good for you. So in case you need to keep stuff uh, private or keep you know, uh, people's activities private that, that they won't be shared. And the last thing is a pan tilt zoom capability. This basically is a type of camera that we're able to manually move left and right, up and down and zoom in and out with. This is especially helpful if we have a manned security desk or a guard station where they may be watching a parking lot and you need to zoom in on a certain section of that parking lot in order to see what's happening there better. So this is a valuable thing, but it does mostly require a human element to get the most out of it. All right, so Chris mentioned perimeter and line crossing analytics. What you're seeing on this slide is a representation of how certain systems will identify a person crossing into uh, a secure area that has been designated within the software and cameras of the system. So the person in the red box has crossed over into a lined area that has been uh, identified as being an unauthorized area for whatever reason, based upon the needs of the organization where the, the camera has been installed. Now, of course, you could think of the different situations where this may be applicable. That would be possibly loading docks that uh, have time limitations on them. That would be certain high security doors or other areas of the building where people should not be at certain times of the day or without uh, proper authorization. It could be sections of parking lots that are off limits except to uh, certain individuals with uh, proper authorization as well. And it could be an area such as a dumpster where there's been uh, vandalism, fires, or illegal dumping. And what this can do is once that uh, indication has been made through the software that the person has violated the secure zone, a message is sent out through the system to an appropriate person in the organization so they're notified. In most cases, it would be the security force who could go and further investigate and take appropriate action. In some cases, it just may be a management uh, personnel who would have to do some type of follow-up uh, as a result of the violation that had occurred. And here what we're going to see is what Chris mentioned earlier. This is a view of a pan tilt zoom camera that's installed in an, in an urban environment. And we can see how powerful the capability of the camera is. This is actually getting an image of a plate on a vehicle that's about 300 feet away from where the camera is actually installed. And you'll see also how a person can be identified at that same distance, and we could clearly see the uh, image of that individual, the fact that they're wearing a coat, there's a different uh, measure of, of uh, coat design there, and those are the things that a person in a guard booth or a command center can do if they see a suspicious situation that's arisen that they need to do further investigation on. Uh, once again, very powerful, uh, capability for this camera, very useful tool, but it does need to be used by an individual in most of the cases to be able to get the maximum use out of a camera with this type of capability. All right, so we're going to run back to some of those features we talked about earlier, uh, WDR and the analytic uh, and the, the light features, light, uh, challenging light situations and how the cameras can deal with those. So if you look at this picture on the right hand side, the no wide dynamic range, what that is is if we just took a camera out of the box, plugged it in, no settings, no nothing, no features turned on, this is just raw out of the box. So what the camera is trying to do is get the best adjustments for the light and color levels possible. So what this is doing is it's the camera saying, hey, I got a really bright picture outside. I'm gonna try to match that so that doesn't get overblown and I can see what's happening which it does perfectly. You can see perfectly out that back window, see what's exactly happening. There's an airplane and there's a bunch of stuff and trucks out there, perfect. Except we don't care about the outside. We're really interested more in what's happening inside. 
it looks like there's some sort of meeting going on, but unfortunately the camera has adjusted to the outside light level, leaving us with a less than perfect inside light level. Okay, no big deal. We have ways to fix this. The first way on the very left-hand side of the picture, the backlight compensation, this was the first technology that came out to fix this. What it does is it takes dark areas in the picture, brings them up in brightness, it brings the whole picture up in brightness to make the dark levels visible. As you can see, it's less than perfect because if you look outside the window, now we're overblown on the light parts of the picture. So we've sacrificed our image outside for a good image inside. But let's say, for example, we wanted to look at both. We can now use the next technology, which is wide dynamic range, which is on almost every camera nowadays, certainly every one that we sell. Um, so this wide dynamic range is allows the camera to adjust scenes individually. So it's not just the entire picture that gets adjusted bright into dark, it's individual scenes. So the front of the picture that's in the dark will be brought up to a median level. The back of the picture, which is now too bright, is gonna be brought back down. So we get a good re uh, a resolution, a good light balance on both sides of that picture. So now we get a really usable view of that entire scene. At nighttime, we also have uh, some issues with light that we have to deal with. And what those are is a lot of times the camera sensor. First one, the smart 3D DNR, that's digital noise reduction. What happens is at nighttime, this is a pretty okay lit scene. There's some backlighting in there. There's some ambient light in this scene. As you can see in the picture to the left, this is not any sort of correction. What's happening is the camera sensor is really turned up because it's not as bright as it likes it to be. So it's trying to pull in all the light possible so we can get a good picture. And when it does that, we get a lot of static and we get a lot of noise and artifacts in the picture, which make it a little bit hard to see details. So what the camera can do now with the software and technology that's built into them is it can wash away that noise, just leaving the, the image afterwards. And as you can see, we get a much better image, much more usable. If something was to happen, we wouldn't have to fight through all that static to see the image. That's all fine and good if we have a good amount of ambient backlight, a lot of street lights or lights off of buildings, stuff like that. Say we're inside in an IT room, like the bottom pictures. This is where another technology called infrared, smart infrared comes in. What this is, is basically a flashlight that's built into the camera except it's a flashlight that looks in, in the infrared range of light rather than the visible range. So our eyes, yours and mine, we can't see infrared light, but the camera has no problem seeing it. So for us, it would look like that camera is dark, but to the camera, obviously, as you can see in the picture on the right, it's as if you turned the flashlight on. So you can see all those areas much better. And the reason it's in black and white, just as a, as a piece of information, is that the infrared is much more, um, clear and, and defined in a black and white picture. In color, it tends to overpower the colors and everything has a weird hue to it and nothing looks natural. So the cameras tend to turn to black and white when they're on their infrared mode because you get a much more usable image out of it. You sacrifice the color for clarity. All right, so we've talked about the system, the differences between analog and digital, uh, what the features are. Now we wanna talk about the fact that the system has to be managed. You would say you've now received the system, it's put in place. You have to certainly be trained so you're very well versed in the, the uh, use of the system. And that's something that you know we would certainly provide you uh, or whatever provide you, provider you were to choose would do. Once you get past the training phase, you need to make changes to your factory passwords to strong individualized passwords to protect your system. So once that's done, you wanna to try to then assign your permissions and passwords on a need-based plan. Most, next most important thing is periodic inspections and maintenance of the equipment. Now I can tell you this from experiences I had in law enforcement when we used to try to do investigations. We had far too many situations where an incident would have occurred and we saw that video cameras were on the site where the incident occurred. And when we would try to get the video from the video system, we would find out that the camera system would not be able to give us the video we wanted because it had not been maintained. Either the parts were no longer working at all or the 
hard drive had been overwritten multiple times or, or a variety of other maintenance issues would come to pass. And one of the worst things was the owner operator did not even know how to operate the system properly. These are expensive, great systems, and you want to be able to keep them properly maintained so that they're always going to be usable when you need the information that they can provide you. So lastly on that, in terms of management of the system, you want to make sure the physical security of your facility and your video equipment is always maintained. You don't want anybody be, to be able to get to it, to damage it in any way beyond the fact that you still want to maintain it properly on a regular basis. Next point we'd like to make clear, because your system is usually gonna be networked, as Chris mentioned, you have to consider cybersecurity. So it's important to have a plan and a policy. It's important to back up your data, not only your, uh, your video data, which is certainly important with regard to the system itself, but also for your business data. We would also always recommend the use of a firewall to ward off any attacks. And it's important for you to understand what potential cyber threats and attacks are out there. Once you've familiarized yourself and set up the system that you have, it's then important to train your staff. And should you have any questions about these types of uh, aspects of cybersecurity, you can certainly give us a call and we can try to assist you with that. And here what we're showing is, again, the, the importance placed on video security systems. What this is, is an excerpt from a Department of Homeland Security best practices for anti-terrorism security uh, list for commercial properties. And this section obviously deals with systems. And when noting the detection, it talks about the importance of the integration of access control systems with video security systems and other safety systems in the building. So it's certainly important enough for the Department of Homeland Security to consider as part of a comprehensive plan for all commercial properties to implement. And I think that really speaks to the, the whole concept of security. Your video security is an important aspect of a comprehensive plan. All right. So last but not least, we're gonna we're gonna throw on a slide here real quick, and uh, I'm gonna make I'm gonna see if you all can can pretend that you're one of my my maintenance people, and uh, I'm gonna give you a, a problem that we received. See if you can figure out what's wrong. The problem said the camera is flickering fuzzy and brown often. Can't figure it out. Let's see if we can figure out what happened to this camera. So this was obviously. This is just a fun slide, but I, this is just to reiterate the importance of proper maintenance. You can have the best system in the world, the absolute best, 100% best cameras. You can have 120 megapixels per camera seeing you know, the hairs on flies, but if you don't maintain it, it's as good as nothing. So with that being said, we'd like to open up now to some questions and answers. We're gonna look in the Q and A board. Um, feel free to keep adding questions into there. We're gonna get to as many of them as we can with the time limit that we have left. And uh, with that said, I'm gonna open up the Q and A board now and we're gonna start taking some questions. Uh, I'm gonna leave this slide up. So if anyone needs some information, feel free, write this down. Please call us with any questions you have or if you have a system and there's problems or if you're interested in the system or just interested in some questions please feel free to reach out to us. We'll do everything we can to help you out. And thank you for your attention. So here we go with the questions. Let's see. I have an analog system right now. What would it take for us to go to IP? Okay, so if you do have an analog system right now and you wanna move that system up to an IP-based system, there are a few options that we can do with that. Um, I would recommend that if you're going to if you don't want to add any cameras into the system and you just want to use the IP, uh, the analog system, I wouldn't switch over to IP at all. I would use high, they, they make now some cameras that are called high definition over, over analog, and that'll bring us up to about 1080p. Uh, and then I can get you, a, or your installer can get you a, a, a more up to date analog uh, or what they call a hybrid, which is analog and IP. So if you wanted to add cameras in the future, those cameras can be IP based and you can just start working from there. 
that is probably the most feasible way to transfer to an IP based system short of re replacing all the wiring in the system. So you can add on future wires into, into a hybrid and then those, those will be IP. And then you can just start slowly taking the analog systems out. But I think the best way to go if you had a full system and you didn't want to upgrade to, you don't want to add a hundred new cameras. You just want to stick with the eight that you have. I would just change the DVR to an R updated one. And I would change those cameras to higher resolution. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, let's see. How would I know where to place my cameras? Bob, you want to take this one? Sure, thanks. So, sure, good question. When we come out to do a site assessment, we will walk the property with you, determine, going back to what we showed in the earlier slides, whether we're looking for actual identification, recognition, observation, or detection. And we can look at what the facility offers in terms of our ability to mount certain cameras and achieve the area of observation that you need by doing that site assessment. And that's how we go about doing that. All right, let's see if we've got any more. Oh, let's see, uh, I'll look through these and see if we get any more here. Okay, are the videos kept forever if they're stored in the cloud? Okay, this is an interesting question. It, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna answer this with everyone's favorite question, it depends. All right, so the reason I say that is the, your video is stored in the cloud, which means that it's under somebody else's supervision. That's fine. You have a contract with that individual or that company. Your videos are going to be kept as long as you, A, continue to pay for this person to keep your video, and B, make sure that the video is kept in a format that you can still see it. So. The videos that are that you've sent to the cloud, as long as you continue that 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 relationship with the cloud storage company that you're with, they should be guaranteeing that your data is safe. There, I guarantee you, they're backing it up. They have they have proper procedures put in place if they're a reputable company to make sure that that data doesn't get uh, destroyed or or diminished due to any environmental concerns or, or or computers breaking down or anything like that. However. They are under no obligation to keep that video should you decide to leave the contract. So that is something to think about that you, with the, another thing to think about with cloud-based storage is it's a relationship at this point, you're relying on a third party. And with that comes all of the business transactions that come with working with third parties. Uh, so let's see, let's go through any other ones here. Oh, there's one right there, Bob. You want to, yeah. sure. I just bought our camera system. Can anyone install it? Well, what we normally do is make sure that it's, it's supplied by us because we want to ensure the integrity of the system that we are installing. We guarantee our work. And because of that, we want to make sure that that equipment is coming from a factory that we have done business with. There are uh, suppliers and manufacturers that certify that equipment as being, you know, first run, properly operating. And we know that at that point, when we're installing that equipment, we could put the full faith of our business and our warranty behind it. We do not install other uh, otherwise purchased systems or equipment for that reason. Yeah. Yeah, so we get a lot of, uh, not in so much in this business of commercial, I used to work for a company that did residential work all pretty much only. And we would constantly have people say, oh, I bought my system at Home Depot or I bought it on Amazon. Can you come put it in? And I will say that there is usually nothing but trouble with that when that happens, because like Bob said, we can't verify the history of this equipment. A lot of this equipment is proprietary. A lot of it only works with certain special uh, accessories, which we may or may not be able to get a hold of. And to be honest with you, the quality of the footage that you're going to get off these systems that you bought at Home Depot and off of Amazon are probably going to be less than ideal. And there's just inevitably disappointment when this thing comes to working and people aren't, aren't getting the system that they had the expectation to get. So that's the advantage of coming with a company like ours. We understand what your expectation is, as Bob said, and we can tailor that equipment to fit that expectation. Um, Let's see if there's any more. I don't think we got any more that came in. Uh, oh, is sound always recorded? Okay, very good question. Um, 
It is not. Uh, in fact, it's almost the opposite. I will almost never record sounds, even if it's available on the camera, because what happens is we get into all sorts of liability. And I think Bob may be able to speak better to that, having a law enforcement background. Yeah, and it, it raises a, a very important legal question. Um, you know, the, the idea of surveillance, uh, especially in the state of New Jersey, is covered by wiretapping laws. And essentially, uh, to be very brief, but ex explicable, you, you can't have a person who's not part of a conversation record a conversation. So you're, it's only in certain public areas that sound could be recorded for a, a certain type of use. So we do not have usually any situation that would fit that criteria to be legally acceptable to make sound recordings through these devices. Thank you. <laughs> I said that much better than I could have. <laughs> All right, let's see if anything else came in. What time is this? 343. So I guess we'll, we'll we're wait like a couple more minutes. If, any, if there's no more questions, then it's about 345. I think we're going to wrap it up. And I hope that everyone was able to get something good out of this. I hope that everyone learned something. And I hope you all enjoyed uh, listening to us uh, uh, explain our camera systems to you. And, uh, and hopefully, if you have any questions, again, I'll reiterate, just uh, the information is on the screen. And I would invite you to please call us with any questions or concerns or, or ideas that you have. And we'd be try to help you out as best we can. By all means, uh, I, I extend my thanks as well. We appreciate your participation. And we're always here to assist you. If you have any questions, pick up the phone, send us an email. We're more than happy to help you out with whatever the question may be.